So <laughs> I'm Isabel Fish and I am the founder of Rubigan. The In Conversations, which is what you're attending today, is a way to connect you to craft and by taking you to the studios of the makers and other places where crafts happened. Today we are being welcomed at Hen and Lock, which is the Royal Embroiderer, a company that started over 250 years ago here in London. And I think it was started by a Frenchman, but I'm going to ask Robert McCaffrey here to confirm that. Hi, Robert. Hello, hello, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Lovely to have you all. Um, my name is Robert, and I'm the communications manager here at Hand and Lock. I'm also an art historian who specialises in fashion and uh, embroidery. So I'm going to be walking you around the studio, showing you various things, and hopefully explaining a little bit of the context and a little bit of the history behind some of those objects. And yes, I will confirm that the company was started by a Frenchman, but yes. more about him later. <laughs> um, uh, I think the first thing that we have to point out is that we have this fantastic shop at the beginning here. So this is where we're standing right now, but we are going to go upstairs and we're going to go to our first meeting room. So we'll follow you. All right. So we are going to go through these rooms. You're going to get an opportunity to see what is currently being teased properly later but for right now the room that you want to see and the best place for us to start the tour is our meeting room well that's quite the meeting room here so this is actually a new space we recently refurbished the whole studio and this space as we have it now used to be a pretty nasty office for one person it wasn't pleasant at all but now it's our wonderful meeting space um, we meet with our clients here, we'll sit down and we'll show them samples and as you can see the walls are covered in samples um, and there are many more besides these but this space is an opportunity to inspire the customer who is sat before us and get them thinking about really interesting embroideries. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Hand and Lock and I'm going to show you some of these sa exam uh, samples and examples. Um, the best place to start is at the beginning. 1767, over 250 years ago, and that was when a French Huguenot refugee was escaping persecution in France and settled in London. Settling in London, he was, um, as most Huguenots were of that time, in textiles. But more specifically, he was a lace maker. Now, when you think of lace, I bet you're not thinking of this. So this oak leaf lace here, if you can just see that, is gold and it's not lace. Not lace like you think of lace probably, but this is a military lace. Gold military laces like this are woven and they contain metal wires. Now feel that. All right. You the should weight. feel how coarse it is. So he was the weaving. Is yes. incredible. Yeah. So how was that worn? This is a, a this hanging is sash. Oh, this is this, hanging sash. Yes, just hung on a wall. Okay. Um, in fact, this is a sample. The real one was much, much larger. So right. that's why it's in our possession. That's one thing to note. When I show you examples of things, most of the time when we make something, obviously it's out of our hands. The customer has it. So if I'm showing you something, it's, I'm most likely showing you a sample or something we've acquired or bought. Uh, the finished items are usually out of our hands. But returning to this, this is a prime example of what M. Hand was making back in 1767 but he was not making the embroidery. In fact, in order to differentiate himself from the other Huguenot lace makers that had settled in and around London, probably Spitalfields, for those of you that know London, in order to differentiate himself from the others, he diversified into an embroidery technique known as gold work. Gold now, work. Do you know gold work? I do, because we actually did a um, workshop on gold work with Hen and Locke. So, and some of you on the, uh, the call are, uh, did take that course too. I just want to double check a little technical carry on talking, okay. but I'll be behind the camera for a minute. Okay, the director needs to check something. Um, for those of you that don't know what gold work is, it requires a little bit of explanation and it is very central to what we do here at Hand and Lock. So gold work is an embroidery technique that evolved out of a, an earlier, very famous um, period called Opus Anglicanum which is English work. It was a type of 
ecclesiastical embroidery that was very famous in Britain. It was English work. It was made by the English. And they would do a type of embroidery where they would often lay the gold on the surface. Gold work is similar to that, but without going too technical, there are differences. So when I explain what contemporary gold work is, or, or more rather what, what, what I'm showing you today is, there are some differences. So for those of you that still have phones with a little coil going from the headset, that's what you need to be thinking of, because gold work, that's what it is. These, what look like little strands of golden hair, are actually little tight coils of metal. So think of maybe a slinky, or think of your coiled phone wire. These little slinkies of gold are actually made by taking a needle and wrapping it around a cylinder like this. And then the cylinder is removed and you're left with that little gold slinky. The gold slinky is then cut by the embroiderer into little sizes, maybe a maybe quarter of an inch, maybe half an inch, usually smaller. And then placing the needle up through the fabric with the cotton, she'll go through the tunnel. Those of you that have been doing this class, you know this very well. You'll go through the little tunnel in the middle of the slinky, you'll plunge the needle back into the fabric, pull it tight, and that slinky will come to sit on the surface, quite secure. And these examples are perfect. So you can see particularly here, all these lines. So each one of these lines is one of those technical term here, slinky, lying flat on the surface. Now what you'll also notice is they're raised. So they're lifted off the surface. There is padding underneath. With gold work, this kind of padding is essential because gold reflects light. And if your gold just sits flat, it reflects light, doesn't reflect light. Reflects light, doesn't reflect light. What we want is it always reflecting light. So by making it a curve, it always is catching and engaging with the light. Why is this so important? Well, if you think about Opus Anglicanum, and I don't have an example here, but this is similar. It is ceremonial, it is ecclesiastical, it is all about the pomp and circumstance of showing the power and the glory of God, of the government, of the royal family. So you want to literally sparkle. Imagine the priest walking down the central nave of the, of the cathedral under candlelight with the stained glass windows around them. They are lit up. The light is reflecting off the surface of their body. If there is any way to inspire devotion, that's it. So of course, gold work went from Opus Anglicanum, predominantly used in an ecclesiastical setting. And of course, when the governments came along and the monarchy came along, it made sense for them to try and adopt that aesthetic to demonstrate their power. Now we've gone from 1767 to medieval Europe. I think we can come back to 1767 now because I think you all have a grasp of what gold work is. And we can look at some more examples of gold work. Um, I just want to say that it's insanely difficult to do. I mean, we took the class and I can tell you that even those of us, I, I can't embroider to save my life, but those of us who um, were, who are, um, uh, you know, really skilled embroiderers and who took the class, they, even them, they, uh, they found it challenging. So it's really, it's, it's insane. So the, uh, the craftsmanship is amazing. Sorry. No, no, on. no. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Um, I want to show you some of these pieces because they are beautiful and they, they show you the diversity of gold work. So if you want to come in, this is, I think this is either a collar or possibly a cuff. I've actually forgotten, but you should always look at the back of a piece of embroidery. It tells you a lot about it. That is the way you determine whether it is handmade or machine made. Now, gold work cannot be machine made, so don't be fooled. But this also reveals that the person has pulled passing so passing has been physically pulled through the velvet through to the back. So you identify that this portion here is passing. And then you can see this is here. This is the gold work technique that I described to you before. So you can learn a lot by looking at the back. What you can also see here, and this is wonderfully tarnished, but you see these little spangles. Spangles are fancy embroidery term for sequins essentially sequins that are stamped out of a, a material such as metal or gold so spangles if you hear that term spangles are um are gold sequins 
looking at that old one and then looking at a newer one, you can see the spangles are sparkling, dazzling. You can imagine someone wearing this certainly catching everyone's attention and that's exactly what this was all about. This was not a fashion uh, statement made by the peasantry. So there's a lot of things to look at here, but one thing I definitely wanted to do as a little fun test is we still make and sell the laces just like we did before. So there's two laces here. One is gold, real gold, 2% gold. One is mylar, but they are fairly indistinguishable to look at. They weigh fairly similar amounts. Um, they shine in a similar way. How do we tell the difference? Because customers do come and mix everything up. How do you think we tell the difference? I think I would uh, say that the gold must be cold to the touch. <gasps> Someone's <laughs> cheated. Someone's <laughs> been risen. Oh no, no one ever gets that. No one ever gets that. Um, touch them to your cheeks. Which one's the cold one? This one. That's the gold yeah. one. So the way we still do it now, it's very, it seems very daft if anyone's ever watching. We'll have a pile of laces all over the place. We'll grab gold, mylar. The, the distinction is significant. A metre of mylar can be over 100 pounds. Sorry, right. correction. A metre of gold can be over 100 pounds. <laughs> a metre of mylar could be two pounds. So we do not want to make that mistake and have someone go out the door with 500 pounds worth of the wrong material. Yeah, I know, that's right. <laughs> and the reason why we still sell the gold is because officers will have it down their trouser legs and they'll really want to make a statement. So these are the kinds of things that we still sell today. This hasn't changed a great deal. Bear in mind, everything I've described to you so far is M. Hand, who started his business in 1767. So why are we called Hand and Lock? Do you know? No, I don't know. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> because S. Lock was a couture embroiderer who started his business in the 50s. He, it emerged from an earlier business that had been operating from the late 19th century. But um, S. Lock was a young protege embroiderer who took over the company. And he himself had been responsible for some quite iconic pieces, the Princess Anne, for uh, Jane Russell and um, Marilyn Monroe sequin gowns in a certain film you might know is that gentleman preferred blondes or yeah. some like it hot uh, i don't know it's the red sequin gowns that marilyn monroe wore yeah. anyway so he was responsible for those pieces so when he took over the company which was ce phipps he renamed it stanley lock and that was his company but what was the couture embroidery that he was doing well it's pieces more like this i think this is a beautiful example i hope this comes yes. up on the camera so these ostrich feathers and crystals and more sequins. Now these are sequins this time because they are stamped out of a, a film or a plastic, but you see the dangling crystals. All of these pieces are best seen moving. And then another example, have you, uh, are any of you familiar with timbre beading? I think you should explain that because uh, Juliet has been mentioning it during our workshops that uh... So tambour beading is the couture embroidery technique and tambour beading is complex. So I'm going to try and help you out here. Would you mind holding this upside down? Okay. There we go. So tambour beading, I'm going to come around to the front so we can see this best. So tambour beading is a French, although some people argue it's not French, but let's admit it sounds French. A tambour beading hook like this is used in tambour beading and it is plunged through the fabric from the reverse. So while you're working at your frame, your design will actually face the floor and you'll be working backwards. And the idea is you will place, plunge this needle, which has a tiny little hook, almost like a fishing hook, through your fabric and underneath you will catch the thread around it, catch it on the hook and then draw it back through the fabric. Then move down a little bit, plunge back in and do the same. And this creates, as you move along, a chain stitch. So that explains the stitch. The stitch is fairly straightforward. You can understand how a chain stitch is created. But if we turn the sample back over again, how do we get the sequins and the beads in? We have to do that by essentially pre-threading the thread that we're working with with sequins. And then as we are going along creating our chain stitch, in between each chain stitch, we bring one sequin up attach it in place but doing that completely blind because it's under the fabric yeah. so you're doing that with the finger that's underneath uh that's underneath the fabric 
bring the sequin up, bring the bead up, etc. So all of these are in rows. That's because the embroiderer was working in a row, then came back, worked in a row, then came back, worked in a row. And if you see these smoky swirls around the dragon, this is an example of a decorative tambour beading stitch. So the embroiderer here switched the sample over, did the same tambour chain stitch with a metallic thread, two different metallic threads to create different shades here. And this is the decorative version of it. So you can do it with or without sequins. In fact, it was originally without sequins because they took them a while to figure out how to do that. So I've explained a little bit about M hand and the connection to ceremonial, to gold lace and to history, and a little bit about S lock and the kind of couture work that they might be doing. But M hand and S lock joined forces in 2001. And that is how we came to hand and lock. We moved into these premises a few years later. We weren't here originally, I'm afraid. And then just this last year, we had a refurbishment. One thing I do need to say to you all is you're the first to see this. No one's been here. So you're seeing all That's of right. this for the first time. That's wonderful. Um, who are the clients? Who, who is, other than the military and the, uh, the ceremonial? I mean, okay, there's the queen and, and uh, her court, I suppose. Well, um, no, But you work a lot with also the, uh, the fashion, uh, the haute couture? Absolutely. I mean, it's worth mentioning the queen is obviously a customer of ours. We, we get invoices, we send invoices to Buckingham Palace. Um, and through the work that we've done for the Queen, we have got the Royal Warrant. For those of you that don't know, the Royal Warrant is essentially a stamp of approval saying, I buy these goods from this company and I like them and I approve of them. I approve enough that they are welcome to tell people that I'm one of their customers. And the I is the Queen. And the I is the Queen. So That's the Queen right. has said, I'm a customer of Handelocks and I'm happy for the world to know. So we have a special little emblem outside and it says that we supply certain goods to the Queen. I'm actually going to show you one of those items in a moment, um, but there's a few things to get through first, such as who are the other customers? Um, at the moment, we're doing a lot of stuff for um, major European designers. So the names that get thrown around in the office upstairs are Christian Dior and Louis Vuitton quite a lot. So with their new shows, I think they're doing things like that. But what's sometimes a lot more exciting are the, the really new young designers who are emerging and who come here and sit with us and get their education in embroidery from us and then go out into the world and create something completely new with us, which is always exciting. And so, challenging you also to change your technique or adapt them or create things that you haven't done before. No, absolutely. And, and I think one of the nice things that we have at Hands and Lock is you can't see, but behind the camera is Lucy. Just out of the shot is Rachel. Everyone here is in their 20s or 30s. So these people are already young and created themselves. So when a young designer walks in, this is our opportunity to sort of really go, okay, what do you want? What can we give you? How should we work together? What can we do? And usually there's a nice collaborative approach to embroidery. Right. And people don't really get taught embroidery in design school. So when they go out and they see all of these things, it might be the first time they've gone and seen tambour beading. They might right. be like, I didn't know what tambour beading was. Um, other customers, our Savile Row for all of the monogramming, which we'll see later, um, but just people off the street walking in with their pet jacket saying, can you embroider my dog's initials on this jacket? That is a popular one. Um, towels, everyone seems to want towels embroidered. What, are they going to lose them? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, uh, and a lot of TV and film. So that's right. probably a, a good broad picture of our clientele yeah where uh did you get involved with the uh the series the queen or downtown abbey uh yes we did some work for the downtown abbey film right um we didn't do i don't believe we did anything for the queen but we did do some stuff for downtown abbey i'm okay. um, sorry for the crown the crown the crown that's what i meant yeah sorry the crown so course. yeah we'll often see things but sometimes we won't know because they won't tell us and then we'll be sat watching netflix at home with a glass of wine and go that's our that's embroidery. Work. <laughs> so that's always a fun one. Um, I wanted to have a little bit of fun at this point. Um, I think you might need to take that jacket off because I'm going to make you oh, this. Okay. So unfortunately I didn't have the foresight to undo this and this is not the easiest thing to undo. So I'm, I'm being as quick as I can. <laughs> Here we go. So this is a Serbian diplomatic uniform. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. 
it's a replica. It's oh, not the re Oh, <laughs> that's a good fit. It is a good fit. How does it feel? Uh, it's heavy. Everyone it's, says it's heavy. It's very heavy, but I have to say that it feels very comfortable. It, it's absolutely balanced. Mm -hmm. And um, how do I look? What do you think? Give us a twirl. There you go. I can't see what's at the back here. So you've got some tails with some gold work again, but for the people at home, you can see the complex panelling that's involved. And that, that's why I wanted to put this on so we can talk a little bit about how, how in reality we do embroidery. A uh, modern embroidery studio doesn't really make clothes. We're not in the business of making clothes. That's what tailors and manufacturers are doing. So when we receive garments, we receive them flat and we will usually embroider panels and then those panels will be sewn together. This is a perfect example of this. We would have embroidered this section, and this section, the collar separately. And then if we go down to the cuffs, you see that's completely separate. That would have been embroidered flat. And at the time it would have looked much like this. Right. Except shinier. And if we turn around again, you can see quite how complex it is. See the seam down the center. So this panel would have been embroidered. This panel would have been embroidered. They would have been put together and that embroidery there would have then been added. So you can imagine this is backwards and forwards going to the tailors, coming back to us. And you see the complexity going further down as well. The reason why I mention this is if we open the jacket up and reveal the inside, you'll see this is Savile Row tailoring at its finest. So a jacket like this takes the expertise of embroiderers like us, but also the fantastic work of tailoring. I mean, look at that. I wish I had any item of clothing in my wardrobe that was as beautiful as that on the inside. Mm. I don't think I have an item that's as beautiful as that on the outside. <laughs> but the first thing that Isabel said was that it is heavy. It is very heavy because the material on the outside is metal. It is 2% gold. Mm. And if someone was to come in today and ask for this to be made, we would probably be quoting them in the region of 30,000 pounds for the task. There you go. So that's a bit of money. Um, you can take orders, place your orders after the call. Let me <laughs> take that off. Thank you. Wonderful, so, thank oh, you so much. And just as a polite note, it is Henry Poole who are the tailors. Henry Poole of Savile Row. I think they'd appreciate being mentioned. Then, it's incredible. I love that. I would wear that to Sainsbury's to do my weekly shop. <laughs> the next thing I want to do is show you one of the processes we do. So we spin bullions. I'm going to take you over to here. If you want to find something on the right. So this is a little demo that we like to do in our tours because it's an opportunity to actually make something. What are we making? We're going to make a bullion twist like this. So these bullion twists are actually just made out of slinkies. Now these are like the gold work we talked before, but you can see they're much thicker and they're springs. So you can kind of feel like they're almost like worms. What we do... The metal too, just because they're cold. Yeah, they are metal. In fact, these are silver. So they have to be kept in tissue paper away from the light to prevent tarnishing. I'm going to move that out of the way because this medieval torture device is what I actually wanted to show you. This is called a bullion spinner. It doesn't have a fancy name at all. It literally does what it says on the tin. So do you still use that or this is an archival piece? We will very rarely use this. Essentially, we have enough ready-made bullions now oh, to probably last us a good couple of years. And we sometimes buy them in because this is a laborious process and it doesn't always go right, as we shall see. Oh, ah, you want <laughs> me to try? You're going to help me do this. Okay. So I'm going to place that on this little hook here and if you wouldn't mind holding these two little pieces of metal at the end and maybe just twist slightly around your fingers so you've got a grip. Yeah, you okay there? So hold it in a V about there. Okay. I'm going to rotate the handle here. It's going to make a horrible noise. Sorry for everyone at home. Um, and just as these two points come together, yeah. just as these two points come together, I want you to pull your hands out. These will join together and then I want it to kind of form a T shape. Okay. Okay. I don't quite understand, but we'll see what happens. It's fine. It always goes wrong. Are you ready? Yes. Three, two, one. And it went wrong. Oh dear. It went dramatically wrong. <laughs> that is literally the worst it's ever gone. <laughs> but if you see, oh no, no, there's nothing. Now you know why we don't do it in house. 
but that would or could have spun into something like that. So what on earth is this and why am I showing it to you? I guess we can go over and have a look at this. Yeah. Right. So this is where we get to speak about the reason why we have the royal warrant. So I need, this is a bit dramatic now, I need to put my gloves on. Why am I putting gloves on? Because this is extremely gold. And I don't want to leave my grubby fingerprints all over it. So just looking at that. Now I've explained a few things as we've gone along. Reason being is I wanted to point at them on here. You know about gold work. You can actually see the gold work along here. You know about the spangles. You can see them in the middle of this portcullis. You can also see the padding that's being used to create some height so it can move around. We've talked about laces as well, gold laces and mylar laces, and here they are. And last but not least, Isabel completely destroyed that bullion. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but there they are in gold. And that is, that is so much work that goes into producing one of these. We produce these for the Queen's bodyguard, her ceremonial bodyguard. We produce these for the Queen's ceremonial bodyguard and they're all ready for her ceremonial occasions, the opening of the Houses of Parliament, things like that. And that work is the reason why we got the Royal Warren. So you're looking at the Queen's products, what she was so pleased with essentially there. There is a little thing that is worth adding, particularly for the international audience, something that a lot of people don't understand about the British monarchy. This will have the ranks of the officer and it will have a crown. Now that crown changes depending on who the monarch is. And the other thing that changes is the cipher. The cipher is the E-I-I-R, Elizabeth Regina II. That changes with a new monarch. So when the queen is no longer with us and we have Charles, theoretically that will be C-R, except the monarch chooses their regnal name. So Charles will choose his chosen name as king and that will determine what his cipher will be. We don't know what that name will be, so we can't guess what that's going to be. That will be a lot of embroidery for us. I was going to say, you're going to be busy. <laughs> We're going to be busy. Okay, I think we've kind of covered the history of Hands and Lock and we've seen some interesting materials. So I think now might be a good time to go up to the archive, oh, which amazing. is a space some of you might recognise. So as you can see, it's a very real building. We're taking you into the uh, communal space. The communal space <laughs> and uh, the real space. We share this building with a couple of other companies. However, we ourselves actually have three floors. So well, that's amazing. We kind of have the majority of the building. Um, some of you may recognise this space. I don't know if you want to pan around a little bit, but this is where Juliet does her uh zoom classes so yes. some of you may recognize it we've temporarily moved her and there is a real world flesh and blood class going on this week i'm going to actually show you this this is the item that i put out when this room isn't the school it is an archive and you can see there are boxes everywhere we have many drafts around but i have picked out my favorite 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 piece this is a victorian regimental ledger dating to the boer war we uh, found this in the basement, in a box, in a puddle. It was literally being destroyed by the elements. And you can see the damage along here. We did a Kickstarter to raise some money. We got a conservationist and he essentially rebuilt the book, removed the grime because the pages were filthy and rebuilt it and rebound it. Why is this so important? Well. He described it as what would have been the IBM computer of the day. This is how this company kept its records and knew what people were doing. This is a lovely little uh, page that's been inserted that dates back to 1901. And this details all of the different regiments and their, um, their graphics, their um, icons, if you like. The interesting thing about this is these don't exist anymore. 1901 was obviously before the First World War and the Second World War. That decimated so many of the military regiments that many of them subsequently merged into each other. So, for example, an element of this one may now be found in 
with this one, or this one may have merged with this one. So when you look at contemporary regimental badges, you might see that they uh, have elements from 1901, but they're all reconfigured. The other thing I have to show you about this book, which I adore, is how it was really used. So, I should probably be wearing gloves, but... So you see the different regim regimental names, and then penciled along here are various orders, sometimes dates as well. Often the dates might say 03, that's not 2003. It might not even be 1903, it could well be 1803. But things like this are so beautiful. So there's this illustration in here showing the person who might be looking at this page what the finished look should be, so they know. But if you look, he's got a little decorative element on his cuff there. And then if I turn this, we can see an actual rubbing that someone has made and put on the page. So this is a very low tech, but very suitable way of being able to see the correct way that all of the different laces and cords need to be arranged up and down the page. I think this is absolutely beautiful. And someone may have done this over 150 years ago. Did they have um, uh, people who specialized in doing the drawings? In jewelry, for example, in the, uh, in, there are people who specialize in doing the gouache the design of the piece before it is created? Well, embroidery, I think a lot of people think that an embroiderer is the only person involved in the process, but like a lot of things, you have an architect and you have a builder. Right. We have a designer or a draftsman, as they were more often called at this period, and then you would have the actual embroiderers themselves. Mm. So these would be the drawings of the draftsmen, right. and they were men. Right, yeah, yeah that's right. In the most part. Um, so that's one of my favourite things, but this is so worth looking at as well. This is always on display up here in the school. So those of you that are in the class have probably seen it before. This is a royal coat of arms. This was done especially for the Queen's Jubilee, the Diamond Jubilee, I think it was. She's had so many. Uh, this was the Diamond Jubilee. And I think one thing you can really see here is how raised it is. You can see the goldwork lion. You can see the silk shading on the unicorn and you can see the various elements. And the actual Oni Sui Mali Ponce, I probably said that wrong, Oni Sui. Oni Sui Ki Mali Ponce. Thank you. There, Latin, French, Latin, French. Um, evil be to th him that thinks evil. So this is the garter belt that essentially says, um, the story behind it is worth telling and I'll tell it very quickly. So a young lady's garter belt fell to the floor in front of the king of the day, who don't ask me who that king was, I have forgotten. And uh, out, of, out of the whole audience that was there, people were laughing. And he came over, pulled it up, and turned to everyone and said, evil be to him that thinks evil. Basically saying, you're not in a position to laugh at this poor young girl. And it's, it's quite a bizarre thing that now that is on our royal coat of arms, but it's a nice way of thinking you're no better than anyone else. Don't point your finger and laugh. Um, I love that. Oh, and one final thing that I learned fairly recently. These are stylized feathers. I think this is when designers go a bit crazy and the designs evolve and evolve and evolve. So I've seen a lot of feathers and they've never looked like this before. <laughs> um, I think now would be a good time to actually go down to where the people work and meet some of them. So we're gonna go downstairs to the machine room. We'll follow you. Okay, well, that was Rachel that you just saw. <laughs> Rachel is our machine embroiderer, and she's who we're actually going to go downstairs and see right now. So, we're coming now back through the meeting room. And actually, there's something worth pointing out just here. So, as Isabel mentioned, we are 250 years old. And 250 year anniversary was in 2017 and we did a lot. We had a big exhibition, we had a um, conference and we also did a big charity project to raise money for Quest, the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust. So that was the Queen Mother, not the Queen. So the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust essentially helps people get involved in craft, get involved in embroidery or any kind of skills making with their hands. So we partnered with 13 different bag designers and made 13 one-of-a-kind embroidered bags. 
Two of them are here, and if you're really eagle-eyed, you might spot another picture downstairs when we go into the workroom. But these were one-of-a-kind bags, so take a moment to look at those and we'll see you downstairs. I told you we would see this space. <laughs> so this is Rachel, who I think you just briefly saw for a second upstairs. <laughs> Rachel's been kindly opening doors for us, but that's not Rachel's job. Rachel's job is our head machine embroiderer and designer. What is your technical title? Um, machine embroidery designer. Machine embroidery designer. So what I said in a different head order, of. <laughs> head of. Um, I think you should explain to us a little bit about the difference between hand and machine embroidery and what we're looking at here. Sure, so welcome everybody to our machine room. Uh, this is very much my domain, this is where I stay, where I can always be found, and these are my babies. Um, <laughs> so we have a few different types of machines here, so they range from every six needle machine um, up to a ten machine. 10 needles and then this is our industrial machine that can take 15 colors at one time so in terms of doing larger more complicated um pieces this is what we'll rely on for like the big the big stuff that's been stuff. going a lot lately that's <laughs> yeah. been used a lot it's been very busy um and so yes as robert said i manage all the machine embroidery here so it's something maybe a lot of people come to Hand and Lock and they don't associate us with machine embroidery as much um, mm -hmm. as the gold work, but um, it is very much, I mean, one of our busiest departments, I would say. It really is. It's, I think when people come to us for hand embroidery, they will always be told four to six weeks for almost any task. Mm -hmm. If they come to us for machine embroidery, they'll be told maybe four to six days. So, um, so it's a lot more time effective and cost effective um, for most jobs. So the beauty of it also is that it can be replicated. So once I create a design digitally using our specialist embroidery software, it can then be replicated and replicated countless times. So, you know, for the likes of costume um, patches for teams, for societies, even for artworks um, and for various fashion items, it's a very important part mm -hmm. of, uh, of our business this? here. I didn't, unfortunately, that is handmade. That, that is handmade. Hand. <laughs> Look at this, how gorgeous this is. This is little brooch. And I'm wearing, I'm from Deptford in South East London. So I've got an anchor, which is the symbol for Deptford. Should have put a shamrock on. You should have put a shamrock on. Oh well. <laughs> uh, Rachel, what is this? So this is the example I brought out to show you all. Um, so this is Boy George, <laughs> um, named after our chameleon sample. So this is an example of how machine embroidery can be created using and layering various um, techniques that our software provides. Um, so basically, as I sort of previously mentioned, our design is done purely with a computer, uh, first and foremost. It can start off with various elements clients bring to me, such as maybe a handwriting sample of their dog, Robert here. Yes, so we build designs completely digitally. Um, and basically through the software, I can choose sort of different elements. So there's a, there's a common misconception maybe that machine embroidery doesn't involve half of the hard work. I think, and the, the toil on the fingers and the eyes that machine, or sorry, that hand embroidery does. Um, I can attest that that is very incorrect because I suffer through it every day. Um, but basically, there's a huge amount of human effort involved, despite the machine doing all the stitching. So everything from sort of the colors chosen, the depth and the sort of density of the stitching is everything um, is my decision. Basically, I have control over that. The machine won't do it unless I tell it mm -hmm. to do it, basically. Um, so yeah, so what we can do is usually we frame it up um, like this and we sort of bring it over to our machines. So you might see I have my little, uh, I have my little chameleon here on the screen. 
And basically what we usually do, this would be a blank piece of fabric, but we just slot it in like so. And I can sort of take it through this touchpad, um, sequencing the colors in the right forms. So I know that one color is not going to be lost beneath another. Um, so again, that's, it's quite technical. There's a lot of um, sort of sometimes mathematics involved, yeah. which is my nightmare to be honest. Um, but yeah, so there's quite a lot of sort of human effort involved, a lot of consideration and everything as well. So um, it is worth pointing out that before we even get to this stage where we're putting the fabric on the frame and pressing go, Rachel will have spent hours essentially digitizing, redrawing it. I think it might be worth showing sure. the guys your Shall computer. Yeah, so yeah. I can show you how the design was created. Okay, you lead the way. Um, so this is where you'll find me day in and day out. So you can see here that I have the digital version, the digital file of our chameleon here on the screen. Um, so how this started was I actually pulled some visuals of different chameleon species um, looking like zooming up very close, looking for the skin patterns, the colors. Um, I had no idea what chameleon feet looked like up until now, but I had to research that and basically pulling on all these elements. Um, I then designed this little guy um, as just a collection for us to keep in house to sort of show for tours and everything. So um, different sort of textures, we have different stitches, different elements. So wow. you can sort of see the base color here. Um, and then I've made the decision to maybe layer a purple over that. Um, and also, you know, things like, these are all different motif runs. Um, so we have hundreds of thousands of these within our software. So there's a lot of decision making in terms of what will serve your design best. Um, also here we have sort of the color, the sequence of colors and all the shapes involved in, so what comes first, what's going to sit well on top of another thing. So quite technical. I personally was a complete technophobe before this job, but I've, uh, it's been a real baptism of fire. The processes are not too dissimilar to hands though, the kind of thought processes you need to go to to get to the final design. It's just there's an opportunity to practice that on the screen here first, look at it, consider it, change something, and then maybe stitch it out and then still change your mind because you haven't wasted 15 hours of a hand before right. it was time. But yes. Um, did did you start, this. Rachel, did you start yeah. with uh, hand embroidery and then moved on to uh, to machine. machine or um, did you go straight into machine? When I started college I was as I said a complete technophobe and I didn't think I would ever work with you know such sort of state-of-the-art machinery on the day-to-day. -day. Um, I was very I was a big believer in sort of the effort and the elbow grease and everything which is still very much there but I just really took, I was actually sort of an illustrator first and foremost, right. but also had a real um, affinity with texture and find a way to combine them both. But I just didn't have the patience to sit for <laughs> 50 hours. <laughs> um, and I just loved, you know, it's very much like endless possibilities. Things do still take an awful lot of time right. um, with like larger files, larger pieces, but to sort of see it, to be able to make those decisions and the software is so great that it sort of displays it to me as if it's already stitched. So it's the closest thing you can get to a visualization, which, you know, the closest thing in hand embroidery would be hand drawing. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so it just presented so many possibilities to me. I was able to make very, very large scale work in a shorter amount of time. So that was what caught yeah. me, I think. Rachel's <laughs> and I being a sold. little modest. <laughs> Rachel actually entered the hands and lock prize for embroidery a few years ago with a ginormous piece <laughs> of machine embroidery that had to be hung, I think, from the ceiling, from the ceiling. of <laughs> a massive room. Um, and, uh, and, and won. Did. She won. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, obviously we couldn't possibly let her slide. We had to snatch her and have her work for us. So that's pretty much how you came to be Thank here. Well yes. <laughs> I think this is an opportunity to meet someone else who works here actually and probably head through to the workroom. So I'm going to lead the way and introduce you to Juliet. So this is 
This is the workroom. This is the main hands and lock workroom. In fact, the building is uh, formerly a school. So this would probably have been the main space where the students would have gathered maybe for their um, morning prayers. This is Juliet here, who some of you may have met before. Hello, Hello. Juliet. I thought we would take a quick moment just to look at what's on the table here and show you what we've been working Amazing. on. These are beautiful. But we, um, we do restoration work sometimes, not a lot, but sometimes. And these are two panels for um, Queen, uh, Queen Alexander's banner in uh, St George's Chapel, that's in Windsor. And if you can see, you can see this beautiful red, but you can also see this kind of khaki brown of the lions. So these lions were originally situated on another red fabric that was so poorly decayed and so poorly damaged that what we've actually done is lifted the lions off and effectively transplanted them onto a new material. You can see, you may not be able to see this because it's a tiny detail, but they have then been covered with a little net, just a simple sympathetically coloured net that then ends just where the end of the lion is. This net is a stabilising uh, material, it's conservation net, and it should hopefully allow this to last a lot longer. What we're doing now is actually edging it in a gold braid. So this is the kind of thing that M. Hand would have manufactured back in 1767. And this will be a, a fantastic detail. It will really let those lions pop. So that's the lions. One little thing worth pointing out is their faces are hand painted. So you can see the eyes, their blue tongue and blue teeth, which I, I don't know why they're blue, but we'll go with that. And it's worth lastly looking over at this other panel, which you can see is on a beautiful frame. They're both on beautiful frames. These frames are so old, but there is nothing wrong with them. So there's no reason why we would change that. You can see that Juliet's got a similar frame, but just looking here, you see the net better here. So this is the conservation net, which you can see is red. The conservation net is to protect these areas here. And when it's completely placed it will be cut away so this yellow is perfectly visible. But you can see again, hand-painted eyes, and you can see another red cord that's outlining the details of the lion. This stance is called rampant. So this lion is just, is just like that. <laughs> and it's, there's specific names for the different poses of these lions, but I like this, rampant. Um, the colors are so vivid in spite of the, uh, the age of the piece. I mean, it's incredible. Um, it's interesting, I wish I could show you how it was before, but it was so delicate, the material underneath, that again, this one has been transplanted onto, is stable and solid, but the original material was just disintegrating. So it was a very complex operation. This is only two panels of, I think, four, and this is the second banner we've done. So we've, we're, we're most of the way through this project. Um, I think now would be a good time to go over and see what Juliet's up to. So those of you that have been in the class will know Juliet already. Hello. But for those that haven't, will you introduce yourself? I'm Juliet Ferry. I'm head embroiderer at Hand and Lock. Um, it's been four years I'm working here. And I work, sorry, and I work in the studio with, uh, with, uh, with my, the other embroiderers. With me. <laughs> yeah, which is, <laughs> doesn't mean you, but. And you are doing monogramming. You do a lot of monogramming, don't you? Yes, at the moment I am doing some monogramming. So it's the art of um, representing letters or um, uh, numbers uh, into embroidery. And that is a specific skill as the letter needs to be, um, needs to look like a letter basically. Monograms by hand embroidery are so meticulous and the way that Juliet does them is really pristine. It's very interesting when we see a picture of a monogram, I can send it to Juliet straight away and say, is this one of ours? And she'll know immediately, no. And she'll be very critical of it as well because she's very precise with her stitches. I think we need to take a step back, Lucy, if you don't mind, that's Lucy behind the camera. And can you please explain a little bit about your station to us? Why does it look like this? <laughs> Just a phone call, don't mind them. Um, so, uh, those are like really old frames and uh, actually I've never seen those frames until I actually worked here. 
uh, you can uh, change the width by uh, unscrewing here on the sides. So that means, so as you can see as well, there is a lot of holes. So my embroidery uh, is, uh, uh, my fabric is stacked over that hole because monogramming is the only technique uh, where you work on something that is already constructed. Uh, so that's why now I'm doing a cuff. Uh, I can't frame the cuff onto, onto the embroidery frame, so I have to um, uh, stitch it uh, to a hole. And then when I do the embroidery, I can have both of my hands working and also I won't be catching any fabric at the back. Um, uh, and that's why when sometimes I have to cut bigger holes, I need to stretch it a bit more to make sure that this part of the frame stay, stay very uh, tight. Very tense. tense. I'm going to just say something here. So we have two hand embroiderers that work at Hand and Lock, and Juliet will use every square centimetre. She will not waste it. She wants her frame to be completely exhausted, totally hold it. She'll even patch up the holes sometimes yes. to maintain That attention. is not my frame, actually. That's my colleague's frame. This will never happen with me. No, but, but <laughs> with Karen, who also works here, she would redo a new one after one hole because she wants that absolute pristine tension at all times and can't be I just love the way you recycle the whole thing. Yeah. It'll last weeks. Um, I don't know about you, but is it Q&A time? I think so. So um, I'd like you to, if you have questions, just type them in. We have a computer here where we're going to be reading them. And uh, I suspect you do have questions. Let me see. Lots of questions by Lots, the looks of it. Uh, comments mostly at the moment. Um, so, I mean, Robert, what were you, let's start with you maybe. What were you doing before Hand in Love? Did you have a life before Hand in Love? No, I was born on the premises. <laughs> um, no, I worked previously in national newspapers and uh, you may have heard of two of them, Daily Mirror and the Daily Mail. And uh, the opportunity to come over to Hands and Lock and essentially represent and research and come to learn more about it was just absolutely fantastic. And since I've been here, which is maybe a hundred years, a hundred years, <laughs> maybe seven years, I actually got so interested in the work that we did here that I went and did a degree in, in art history to kind of support my understanding. Um, but yeah, my, my background is writing. Amazing. Um, so here we in the uh, in the room, there's lots. Where do the, uh, the thread, for example, where does that come from? Where do you buy that? Well, Juliet. Uh, they come from... Oh, oh. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Juliet's so engrossed in her work, she forgot to join us. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, so the threads, uh, they come from our supplier, uh, which is in the UK. I have no idea where they are manufactured, but uh, the supplier is from the UK, yeah. Our beads are, I think our beads are, tell an interesting story. Because one of the rooms that we worked, walked through before um, was formerly a room we called the bead room. It was our meeting room. All those beads have now been transplanted here. And I think you have literally looked in every one of these boxes and chosen what to keep and what to go, go away. Yes, yes. Because some of the beads, they are completely vintage. So it will be impossible uh, to reach the same quality uh, because, you know, Things are change. They, are they glass beads? Uh, they sure. uh, glass beads. So, uh, wait, what's a good one? This one. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Straight to it. So, for example, I don't, it's super tiny. I don't know if you're going to be able to see that. Those are tiny, tiny metallic beads. They are less than one millimeter in size. Um, so, for example, this, you will not be able to find it anymore. It's you, they just don't make those anymore. So this is this is really uh, history. I think we should keep at least one. <laughs> we can use the rest, but keep one. There's a question here. Is the cuff basted all the way around on the frame? Yeah, uh, so maybe you can have a, a closer look, you see? So I don't know if you can see the stick. Well, I remove my hands. Maybe I point with my scissors. Do you see here? This is my ba basting line. So for those that are technical, they're essentially little tacks that yes. hold the, uh, the, the pajamas, in this case, to the linen uh, that's got that hole cut out. So the tension is maintained through the pajamas as well for you to work on. But they're just little tacking stitches? Yeah, just little tacking stitches. Uh, I would say just uh, 
not a running stitch, but just yet attacking stitches. Yes. There's a question about uh, do you have papers or possessions belonging to the original Huguenot who set up the business? That's a really good question, and I'm so disappointed to report that a lot of things were lost. Um, I know that one of our premises was bombed in the Blitz during the Second World War, and yeah, there's been a few disasters over the years. So the reason why I wanted to show you the Victorian regimental ledger is it's one of the oldest and best conditioned things that we have. It is worth noting, and all of you are out there, we have a huge archive of materials that we haven't been able to sort through properly. We do not have a conservationist on site, nor can we afford to employ one in, in a non-commercial role. So if anyone is interested in researching hands and lock, they're very, very welcome to come along and be that person. Mm, amazing. Um, is there another question? I think there might be another question. I have Huguenot ancestry, silk weavers, so I'm really curious. Oh, I've got someone who wants, who's interested in researching this. Oh, Get in amazing. Touch. <laughs> no, no, yes, um, by all means, just uh, email me and I'll, uh, I'll put you in touch with Robert. Now, I have to ask a question. You have royal clients. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? Do you go to the palace? Do they come to you? Is it all done by screen? Queen? The Queen walks in. The Queen walks in? <laughs> the Queen walks in. She says, I'll take that, I'll take that, I'll take that. Um, she gives you a form. It's ladies in waiting a lot of the time. It's intermediaries. It's, it, yes, there's not that direct connection. I think sometimes people maybe pull up in a car outside and someone comes and runs in and collects it and they're in the car, but it's not like, the Queen isn't sat in the meeting room discussing embroidery with us. Oh, oh, very sorry. We <laughs> do sign a lot of NDAs. Uh, a NDA, a NDA, lot of NDAs. I've probably broken the non disclosure agreements <laughs> maybe 10 times during this session. Oh dear. Oh dear. Um, don't you. Ah, there's Geese and Hawks are mentioned here. Geese and Hawks are one of our major clients on Savile Row. So for those of you that don't know, Geese and Hawks are uh, tailors. They have a portion of the business that is military tailoring. In fact, the epaulette that I showed you upstairs, the Queen's Bodyguard epaulette, the full uniform, the rest of that uniform is made by them and it is um, kept in their attic, which you can go and visit and you can visit their archives. So yes, we do a lot of work with geese and hawks. Any other question? Um, no. I think we might have come to the end of our tour. Thank you very much, Isabel. It was amazing, really. Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you so much. It's so nice to meet you. Yeah, I, know, I can't you. Yeah, yeah. But it's really nice to meet you. Yeah, elbows. Absolutely, elbows. Um, thank you, really. Uh, I think it's been a, an amazing tour. I hope that you all agree. Um, really, that was as close to having you in the studio as we can get. You had uh, a technical problem to start with. You had a bit of uh, shaky filming you went up and down the stairs we looked in the boxes you were the um, first to see all of this as well this is brand brand new it's just uh, reopened a few weeks ago um you know i hope that we gave you an hour of dream and an hour of also inspiration to go back to embroidery i received a lot of messages from you saying oh i used to embroider and maybe this is going to inspire me so i really hope you do uh, we are fully booked for the upcoming workshops with Hand and Lock, but I'm working with them and creating new series for next year. So if you are interested, uh, because there's only 10 students per class, let me know now and I'll put you on the waiting list. Um, thank you for being here and for being with us. The next in conversation, I'm in London for uh, another two weeks, so there are a lot of conversations coming up. The next one is Saturday with a silversmith. I'm driving to Suffolk and we are going to go and visit the atelier of Miriam Hanid, who is an exceptional uh, silversmith who has a very rich personal history that inspires her and um, who's enormously talented. So I'm looking to forward to that. Sunday, we have two more uh, jewelers, this time back in London. You'll see the details on the website. Those are free uh, conversations, so you know, take advantage of it. And next week, uh, we're going into art and uh, different kind of craft. 
So I hope you'll join me. It was wonderful having you and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.